Are you a barrier breaker? Are you ready to live life with no more limits? That's what we're going to talk about today as Arkansas Alive starts right now. Thanks for joining us. This will be our second week in the series, No More Limits. Again, just to show you the history and the beginning of this revelation, keep, keep this in mind. Um, when Jesus uh, spoke to Peter in Matthew 16, he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to show you how the kingdom of heaven operates. I'm going to give you the keys, the authority, the revelation of the kingdom of heaven, how the kingdom of heaven operates. But in Matthew 24, Jesus told his disciples, I want you to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the world. Now notice, there is the revelation of the gospel of the kingdom. And then there's the revelation of the kingdom itself. There's the gospel of the kingdom. There's the revelation of the kingdom. Two distinct things. There's the revelation of the gospel of the kingdom. And there's a revelation of the system of the kingdom, how the kingdom operates. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news that Jesus came to seek and save those that were lost, that Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But the revelation of the kingdom itself is how it works. And that's what we're dealing with today as we talk about no more limits. We're talking about how the kingdom works. Now, I wrote this book and it was published by Harrison House in 1990. Eight, I think that's correct, 1999. The revelation came to me in 97. I taught it for one year in our church in 98. In 99, this book came out. Now, the book is no longer in print, no more limits, but Whitaker House picked it up and revised it and retitled it Unleashing Heaven's Blessings. So if you'd like to get your copy of what I'm teaching, No More Limits, go online I'll give you all this information at the end of the broadcast in order unleashing heaven's blessings. And while you're at it, you can also go online and order this little uh, USB uh, thumb drive. This is what I'm teaching you. This is complete volumes one and two entitled No More Limits. Take the limits off your life. Listen to it every day. Uh, we'll be talking about this all this week again. So let's go to Psalm 78 and let's look at our text. Remember, this is what the Lord spoke to me in 1997. I meditated on it, got the revelation, studied it, taught it to our church for a year, and then wrote the book, and I'm teaching it to you over the air. No more limits. Um, Psalm 78, verse 40. How often did they provoke him, God, in the wilderness rebel against him, and grieve him in the desert. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy, how he wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. How do you limit God? You can't limit God in his person, in himself. God is spirit. God is not limited in himself, but you limit God just like the Israelites did. They rebelled against him. They provoked him in the wilderness and they grieved him in the desert. How did they grieve him? How did they rebel against him? Just stop and think if you know the story. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, been in bondage 400 years. Now they're going into the promised land. They go across the desert. They were there 40 years. They didn't have to stay in the desert 40 years. I've been to it many times in Israel. You can drive it across it in a day. So why were they there 40 years? Rebellion. And God said, I've brought you out. They murmured and they complained about the, uh, having to get the quail and the bread 
It was fresh every day. It was like the bakery comes to your house and delivers fresh bread and, and manna quail every day. He said, you don't even need to store it up. In fact, don't store it up. Store it up because it'll rot and putrefy. They stored it up anyway, and it stunk. And, you know, you're thinking, what is the matter with these people? Well, of course, they weren't born again like you are. They weren't as smart as you are, you think. <laughs> they saw the miracles, the signs, the wonders. They saw God part the Red Sea. They saw God do supernatural things. And now they're in <clears throat> their journey towards the promised land, and they don't think God can take care of them. They don't think God can take care of, of their, their physical needs, their financial needs. They got all the wealth of Egypt, and God's feeding them uh, in the desert every day. And they're rebelling against him. And, you know, the reason they were there 40 years is because of the rebellion. God said, I'll just wait till this generation dies off. And then this new generation can go into the promised land. As I was preparing for this message for this week's taping, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, tell the people, that I want them to get up from where they are. Now, I'm speaking to you by the Spirit of God to get up from where they are and to prove God and see if He won't take the limits off their life that they have placed there. You have placed those limits on yourself through ignorance, through wrong teaching, wrong doctrine, experiences, failures. You put those limits there. He said, tell the people to get up and, sh and prove me and, and I will show them that I am unlimited to do for them and to bless them wherever they go and whatever they do. Now, that's the, the, the crux of what he said to me. So I'm saying that to you today. I'm encouraging you. This is a brand new day, a brand new week, whether you're starting your day or ending your day. This is a time for you to take the limits. No more limits. Just whatever limits you've had, just see them as gone. God, take them away. He said he would. Take away your stinking thinking. Take away your fears. Take away your limits that you've placed on yourself, on your family, your business, your ministry. Take the limits off. Now is the time, said the Lord. Now is the time to remove all the limits and let me be God. Let me be big in your life. Amen. Now take that. Receive it. Believe it and act upon it because God said he's ready, willing, and able to remove any limits. He's not limited. Don't limit him. Okay, so they rebelled. Um, they were stiff-necked. He called them that. Um, it, they didn't want to do what he said. Even Moses disobeyed him. And some say that's why he didn't go into the promised lands because he disobeyed God. God told him to talk to the rock and water would come out. And what did he do? He hit the rock, the rock with his rod, which is not what God uh, told him to do. Obedience is so important. So this is our text. This is where we started last week. No more limits. Don't limit God. How did the Israelites limit him? They rebelled against him. They grieved him. They turned back and tempted him. And by doing that, the Bible says... They limited him. See, God's not limited in his being in himself, in his DNA. But he is limited in what we can do, what he can do for us when we grieve, grieve him, when we rebel against him, uh, when we turn back, when we tempt him. He's limited in how he can bless us. He says, I'm limited in how I can help you because you've limited me. You won't let me bless you. This is the, this is the revelation of the kingdom. Are you getting it? This is the, how the kingdom operates. Okay, then uh, it said they remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy, wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the fields of Zoan. So God wants us to remember those things, not live in the past, but remember those things that he did for us. If he did it once, he can do it again. So remember the things that he's done for you. Okay, now today, let's go over to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Now here are the things that we're going to look at. Um, 
I started off this week with 1 John 5, 4 because it talks about overcoming the world system. And there, there are some issues, some points, bullet points that I want to deal with. Um, in 1 John 5, verse 4, it says, Whatever is born of God, that's you, that's me, whatever is born of God overcomes the world, the world system, and this is the victory that overcomes the world system, our faith. Three things. One, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You are automatically a world overcomer when you are born into the kingdom of God, translated out of the kingdom of darkness in the kingdom of God's dear Son. We've, we've been translated out of one kingdom into another, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. The problem is the church has not, we've, we've, we've switched kingdoms, but we haven't switched systems. We haven't learned to think like God. We haven't learned to talk like God and act like God because of religious teaching. We've been taught we're no good, unworthy, can't do anything. You never know what God's going to do. God is sovereign. Anything that happens to you is the will of God. We've been taught wrong. So we've translated out of kingdom darkness, kingdom light through faith in Jesus Christ, but we haven't switched systems. We haven't learned to think differently. We haven't learned to think like God thinks. So number one, whatever's born of God overcomes the world. Number two, this is the victory that overcometh the world. Uh, you have been made a victor. God wrote this down. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You are a victor. You, you are victory going somewhere to happen. That, now, that's what God said an overcomer was. They were victors. And this word victory is from the Greek word nikeo, uh, which we know better as Nike. The Nike Corporation capitalized on this, and, and they're promoting their athletic gear, but they're promoting victory. You wear their gear, you're going to win. You wear their gear, you can jump higher, run faster. They're trying to seed you with this thought of victory. So whatever's born of God overcomes the world. Number two, this is the victory that overcometh the world. Number three, our faith. Without faith, there'll be no victory. Even though victory is set for you, even though you're born into the kingdom, you're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, even though God has done it legally, you will not partake of it vitally without faith faith. You're saved by grace, but it's through faith. Everything requires faith. Without faith, you can't please God. We'll look at those scriptures in just a minute. So, what is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory. Our faith. Our faith produces the victory that God has already said belongs to us in the kingdom of his dear son. Now, let's go and look at some of these scripture verses that will help you see this. Let's go over to Revelation 2. Um, according to the Bible, according to Jesus' letter to the churches in Asia, you are an overcomer. And it, it suggests in these passages of scripture that Jesus is coming for overcomers the rapture of the church. You could say it this way. All the overcomers are going to be raptured. All of those that are overcoming. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 2. Let's look at verse 7. He that hath ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He didn't say to the sluggards, to the backsliders, to the slackers, to the doubters, the fearful. He said to the overcomers. We're talking about not limiting God. No more limits. Then go to verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. There's that word again. 
overcometh. Now let's go to verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Let's go to another verse. Let's go to verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Whew. Folks, we're coming into a time where you've got to know these things. You've got to know that you, the redeemed, are going to rule over nations. You've got to know that we're at the end of the end time. And overcomers are going to be given authority to rule over nations. Let's go to uh, chapter 3, verse 5, Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, the same should be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. So if you're an overcomer, he says you're going to be clothed in white raiment, in white linen, beautiful, glorifying God. Hallelujah. Okay, let's look again at verse 12. Um, to him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of the heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. All of this is, is, is addressed to overcomers. And last, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Oh, <laughs> even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Did you see that? Did you get the identification, the identity there? He's going to grant you that overcome. He's going to grant you the, the position of sitting with him in his throne. Even as he overcame, Jesus overcame, and sat down with his father in his throne. Now, we see this in Ephesians. Go with me over to Ephesians, and let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. It says, verse 4, by God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, where wouldn't he loved us? Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's, there's in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. There's two scripture verses that's, that, that, confirm that the overcomers are going to sit with Jesus in his throne because they overcame like Jesus is seated with the Father in his throne because he overcame. Whew, hallelujah. That's exciting. Okay. Let's define the word world because we're going to read several passages of scriptures. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They overcame. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's the legal side of redemption. That's what Jesus did by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary his substitutionary sacrifice. He became our sin substitute. We overcome by the blood that he shed, his blood. We apply it. The old, test, the old Pentecostal saints used to say, plead the blood. We plead or we apply the blood of the cross as a covering. You overcome by the blood. That's the legal side of redemption. That's what God's already done through Christ. And the word of our testimony, that's the vital side of redemption. That's what you do. That's what you say. Let, 
Let, let the weak say I'm strong. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What do you say? Well, I'm just a pilgrim trudging through the heat and the cold. No, you're not. That is not correct. That's wrong. You learned that in some Sunday school class in some denomination that told you you were a worm and unworthy and that you didn't deserve anything from God and that you're just a pilgrim trudging through the heat and the cold. That reference is referencing Abraham as he pilgrimaged from his home city, uh, the Ur, the Chaldees, to uh, where God had for him uh, to go. He told him to leave the land of his father and come to a place where he would show him. The land of Abraham's father was, uh, um, at the time that he was told by God to leave, was overcome with darkness. They were beginning to worship the moon god. His name was Sin, S-I-N, very appropriate. They were worshiping idols. They were worshiping uh, not uh, Jehovah Elohim. They weren't worshiping the God of Abraham. They were worshiping the moon god. And so God told Abraham to leave, to come out from among them uh, and be separate. And Abraham obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. And, and that's what we refer to as a pilgrimage. Pilgrims trudging through uh, the land that uh, does not belong to them, going to the land that does belong to him. But denominationalism and religion has, has crippled the church by, by using that to describe the redeemed. And it doesn't fit the redeemed. It doesn't describe us at all. We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of our testimony is that we are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb, by what Jesus did. Our faith is in Jesus and everything He did for us. So He says, you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Then you go to Revelation 22. We're talking about no more limits. You, you got to know these things to take the limits off. Revelation 22 and verse 12, Jesus said, red letters, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. <clears throat> Folks, we are going to be rewarded for everything that we do in his body, in the body of Christ, in the, in the church, everything that he asks us to do. Now, you're not going to get rewarded for everything that you want to do. You're not going to get rewarded for every idea that you had. You're not going to get, and that's probably the problem that we face in our culture today. Knowledge has increased to the point where, I mean, it's phenomenal what man has attained. It's phenomenal what this nation, America, has attained. There's no country like America. And, and yet not get lift up in pride, but in appreciation and gratefulness, we're thankful for what God has done. But in, in our knowledge, in our ability to think and to create and to produce goods and you know, the technology that we have today is absolutely unfathomable, uh, uh, stuff that the average person doesn't even, doesn't even know about. And yet we see it every day in all the, the gadgets, the phones, the iPads, the computers, the televisions, etc. All the stuff uh, that, that, that God has empowered man, given man. I mean, if it wasn't for God, man couldn't do any of it. But God has enlightened us, especially those that believe in Jesus. But the, there, there is a danger here. There's always a ditch on each side of the road. The danger is, is that we've become so, how would I say it, obsessed with all this knowledge and all this creativity that there's a lot of things that we are doing and inventing and implementing <clears throat> that are creating problems instead of solving them. And I know you'll think, some of you will think this is old-fashioned thinking, you know, Pastor Caldwell, he's old school and a uh, different generation and blah, blah, blah. But there are people today, if they'll be honest, they'll agree with me. Let's just take, for example, and I am not complaining, I'm not murmuring, I'll, I am enjoying 
the blessings of God, and I'm appreciative of it and, and, and thankful. But I recently um, got an automobile, I say recently, a year ago, that had all of the technology that you can imagine. I really didn't want all of it, but it was a lease program, and they just said, here's the car we're offering, here's the lease, and blah, blah, blah. Um, J. Paul Getty, I think it was, said, anything that appreciates, buy it. Anything that depreciates, lease it. <laughs> so I leased this car. It's ridiculous what cars crawl, cost today. And the reason they cost so much aside from all the technology that they've got in them, which has nothing to do with the automobile itself, has nothing to do with its ability to get you from point A to point B in comfort. It has nothing to do with that. It's all this technology that man is regurgitating. He don't know what to do with it, so he just sticks it here and there and there and there. And we got so much stuff now. And this, this automobile, half of the stuff that's on there I don't even, didn't want it, don't use it. I'll turn that car back in and, and a lot of it will be totally unused, brand new. And I've observed um, some of it doesn't even work 100% of the time. I mean, you know, in the modern cars, you put your foot on your brake and you push a button. Now you have the key bob in your pocket and, and it all works on batteries and transmitters where you push the, the, the button to start and you put your foot on the brake and the engine starts. And then all these sounds and bells and whistles go off and it's telling you the fast your seat belt and it shows you the road and everything and the click, click, click. And it's just a whole lot of bell ringing and dinging going on of all the systems that are in this car that unless you're, you know, geared to all of it and, 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 and a techie, you don't even use. You, you don't even care about it. And too many times when I push that button to turn it off, it won't turn off. It just keeps running. Sometimes the technology works. Sometimes it doesn't. And we're, we're, we're compelled to all of this. I'll stop here today. <laughs> We'll pick this up tomorrow. We're running out of time. VTN's on Facebook. Uh, VTN, your Arkansas Christian Connection. So follow me on Twitter if you like, happy underscore Coldwell. This episode is available to watch online. Log on to vtntv.com and click watch on demand. If you want to watch it over again or you miss it or you want to share it with somebody, VTN's available to watch 24-7 via live stream, vtntv.com. Click on live stream. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.